I am a mathematician by training, and last year I got to teach a first-year writing seminar. So that was fun. Um, it was, uh, so at Vanderbilt, every freshman in the College of Arts and Science has to take a first-year writing seminar, and every department has to offer one. And that's kind of the fun part, because the math has to offer one, right? So I taught a first-year writing seminar on cryptography, codes and code breaking. And I didn't use a lot of social media in this, but I did set up a blog for the course, so a course blog, and I didn't do a lot with that either. Mostly it was just me posting announcements and links to handouts and things like that. Um, but the students had three writing assignments in this course, uh, papers, and so the second paper was an expository paper. There are hundreds and hundreds of codes and ciphers, code breaking, that kind of stuff, that we could have studied in this course, but we can't cover them all. And so what I wanted the students to do was to kind of broaden their their repertoire of codes and ciphers with which they were familiar. Um, so I asked each student to identify a code or a cipher that we hadn't already studied in the course, and they had to write a five-page expository paper about it. Where did it come from? Who invented it? Why was it invented? How do you use it? How do you crack it if people know how to crack it? What legacy has it had in cryptography? So expository, right? Explanatory stuff. They weren't making an argument in this paper or expressing opinions. They just needed to do some research and kind of describe what the thing was. Since I wanted them to kind of learn from each other a little bit, right? They were identifying, I had 15 students, and they all picked different codes and ciphers, um, and they're writing this stuff. I, I didn't want to be the only one to benefit from reading their papers. So um, I wanted them each to read two of their peers' papers and respond to that, leave some comments. Now, you know, if you've taught writing before, this is not crazy talk, right? This is the kind of thing you do. Um, this was a little bit new to me. But in order to facilitate that, I put all of their expository essays up on the course blog. So you can see a few of them. Each one got its own post with a little attached PDF file that had the student's paper. I let each student tell me if they wanted to use their real name on this or if they wanted to just use their first name or their last name or some made-up names. Totally up to them. But I did, I was telling them, that they knew ahead of time they were all going to go up on the website. Now, two very interesting things happened the next week. One was, a student comes in and he says, you know, I was Googling my paper topic. And my paper topic is now the number three result on Google. Or, excuse me, my paper is the number three result for that paper topic. He said, you know, some high school kid is going to cite my paper. <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> That's why I wanted it to be a good one. So this was kind of, now he picked a pretty obscure paper topic. There's not a lot out there in the Great Paris Cipher. Um, so, so his competition was minimum, but, but there he was. It's actually, somehow it, the PDF and the blog post, so it's actually number three and number four when you look at it that way. Um, but he was kind of shocked to realize that, you know, just a few days after this went up on the blog, that Google had already indexed this and, and it was kind of jumping up the rankings. So that was pretty cool. Then I had another student, he wrote a paper on something called the Chaos Cipher, which is a really cheesy name for a cipher, but it's a thing. Um, he wrote a paper. Um, as I said, I had the other students, each student had to find two of their peers' papers, read it through, and then respond to some basic questions about it. So he had written the paper. A couple of his colleagues had, in the class had, had done this. So there was the blog post, and there was a couple of comments from other students in the class under the blog post who were responding to the paper. And then, so the student comes in to class, and he says, I'm paraphrasing, the dude for my footnotes read my paper. So uh, Moshe Rubin is a cryptography researcher. He knows a lot about the chaos cipher. It's one of his, his uh, areas of expertise. Um, my guess is he has a Google alert set up for chaos cipher, and when new stuff comes out about it, he pays attention. And he found this blog post. He read my student's paper. He read the other student's comments about the paper. Those students in particular had raised a number of interesting questions that the first student really hadn't addressed in the paper because he didn't have access to the information. Um, and so this researcher comes through and he responds to the questions raised by those other students. And this is just part of it. I mean, it was like a 500 word comment here where he had taken time to read and, and, and give some more information, right? I mean, he knows this better than most people. Um, and so uh, this kind of blew my students away that this happened. And so I had thought some things like this could have happened in this course. I didn't really expect them to. I kind of hoped that something <laughs> might. Um, but I think what my students took away from this was that by putting their work out there in the open web, real people read it, and Google robots that search the web and index things, right? Real people and real robots read their work, um, and in this case, responded to it. 
The first set is course blogs. So I said a little bit about how, how I used to blog in that semester. And it was pretty rudimentary. It was mostly me posting stuff. In fact, it was all me posting stuff. I posted some of my students' papers, but I was the one who wrote to the blog. Now, other instructors have had students write to blogs. Um, and that's where things get pretty interesting. So um, I worked with a, a sociology professor at Vanderbilt, um, Shaul Kilner. Um, and he had been teaching this really interesting course on the sociology of tourism for a few years. And part of the fun, I mean, we live in Nashville, Tennessee. We got tourist sites all over the place, right? So it's a nice town to think about how tourism works in our society. And um, so he had taught this course for many times. Um, he'd gotten some pretty good recognition for this, because there are a lot of field trips in this course. And he had students do some pretty interesting stuff with experiential learning. Um, and, and what he had been doing was having his students um, essentially write travel diaries. So they would go on a field trip, you know, this week they'd go to this site, the next week they'd go to some hotel, the next week they'd go to a museum, wherever. Um, and he'd have the students reflect on their experiences and connect the kind of abstract pieces of the course with the experiential pieces of the course. And he, he, he said, you know, students when they travel don't really write in a diary anymore, right? They don't write on pencil and paper. They set up a blog and they share photos with their family and friends and stuff like this. And so he says, I want to kind of have that experience. Um, and so what he did was he set up this, this blog for his course, Tourism, Culture, and Place. I think I've got a little zoom in here. <coughs> um, and he did this. With, Vanderbilt has a blog server, and he was able to kind of set that up. Did you really lock the door? Oh, no. Okay, Tony can come. Good. Okay. Sure. He joked about locking the door earlier, so I was like. So, um, so Cheryl set up this blog, and the idea was that each week students would post something there, these reflections. And the other thing that he wanted to tap into was the fact that all of his students had a camera in their pocket. They call it a phone, but it's a camera. And so that they could actually take photos and integrate that into their reflections. So he wanted a little multimedia, and he wanted kind of a more natural feeling venue for students to reflect on these experiences. And so I, I picked a couple of these. He, he did, used another approach that I think is really clever. And I learned about this term from Gardner Campbell, who's now at Virginia Tech. And he talks about having a mother blog. So Shaul had a blog. Each of his students had a blog. And the course blog kind of it, it copied in all the content from the student blogs in one spot. So you go to the course blog, and you see this. Everything kind of looks the same. But as soon as you click on the link to any of those posts, you go to that student's individual blog. And it's their own space to design however they want, pick the theme they want, use the blogging software they want. Um, and so here, they were visiting uh, yeah, Fort Nashboro, which is downtown Nashville, and talking about, you know, there's a lot of replica here, but is it authentic? And so this was a topic. And these are photos the student took. Um, this student, this was kind of interesting, um, these students, and I, I think Shaul kind of asked them to do this, but when students traveled that semester for spring break or what have you, this guy went to an engineering conference in Cookville, Tennessee. And so he got to think about what is it like to be a tourist in this other town, right? There were several posts about spring, uh, spring break trips and thinking about the tourism aspects of that kind of stuff too. So again, students were being places, taking photos, reflecting on this, and I think the key ingredient here is is that given the mother blog, it was really easy for students to see each other's work. So they were writing as much for each other as they were for Shaul. Let me show another example. Actually, well, yeah, we've got at least one person in the sciences here. Um, uh, I, I hear from science faculty sometimes when I talk about course blogs and they're like, seriously? Like writing in the sciences? What are we doing here? Um, this was really interesting. I learned about this from, uh, from Gardner Campbell. He was at Baylor University before he was at Virginia Tech. And Brian Gibbons is a biology faculty member at Baylor. And so he has this kind of inquiry-based lab experience that his Bio 101 students go through. And so they're, um, I don't really understand this, but they're identifying phages, P-H-A-G-E. I don't know. They're looking at stuff. And I, but it's basically this kind of structured research experience the students go through during the semester. And they blog kind of a research journal. They blog about what they're doing. And so let me show you just a couple of posts. He's got the mother blog thing going on too. So each of the student posts looks a little different. Um, so there's a lot of different contributors here. But this one, you know, last week in lab, I prepared my samples for archive and put them in the freezer. Here's what I've been doing. Here's a picture of the stuff that I'm looking at. Right? She didn't take that with her cell phone, I understand. And then here, last day in the lab. <laughs> I love her title. If it's green or wiggles, it's biology. A college freshman's journey through the sciences on the road to medical school. Um, and this is her kind of reflection over the lab. Uh, yes, they, they 
They picked one of these things called Dorothy. She ends with top five things I learned in the lab this semester, right? So there's a reflective component here as well. Um, and again, when you've got all these students going through this experience together, right, they're, they're reading each other's posts, they're, they're, they're kind of sharing things in ways that they wouldn't otherwise. Social bookmarking. So I'm teaching a statistics course this semester. I have 75 engineers in this course. And uh, I, it's an applied statistics course in that they're engineering students. They're not math majors or stats majors. They want to use statistics in their field. And so I want them to start seeing connections between the statistics and the probability that we're looking at in a course and other stuff in their lives. Preferably their engineering work, but I'll take anything at this point. And so I've set up a group within a social bookmarking site called Digo. Now, social bookmarking, a lot of folks aren't familiar with this term. Anyone heard that term before? A few of you? OK. So usually when you find a website that you like, you hit the favorite button on your web browser. And then you can go back to it later, right? if you're at that computer and using that web browser, right? So these are services that allow you to basically hit favorite, and it goes out to some digo.com web server, and then you can access it no matter where you are later. And you can share it with other people, and that's the key ingredient here. So I've set up, you can have a group within Digo. So I've got a group for my students, and every couple of weeks I give them a social bookmarking assignment. And I say, the first one, we were looking at data visualization as one of the first chapters in the course. And so I said, I want you to find an example of data visualization anywhere on the World Wide Web. <laughs> right? I'm keeping it pretty broad. I want them to think about their own interests um, and what they want to read. Right? If they want to read about a lot of sports and they see data visualization while they're reading the sports news, great. Go ahead and bookmark that and share it with the class. Um, so let me show you. So this is kind of what the group looks like. Math 216, stats for engineers. You know, as they post things to the group, uh, you get this little link. It's shared by Paul. I liked that one. Paul leaves a comment. I can leave a comment. Other students can leave a comment. You get a little bit of interaction. The key ingredient is they get to see each other's stuff as they share. And it's kind of fun to see how the comments start to, to work here. Um, so this was one of the early uh, the data visualizations that they picked. It's about how people consume alcoholic beverages. They can tap into their interest any way they want. It's a perfectly good stacked bar chart on the right there. We can totally talk about data representation on this. For the second social bookmarking assignment, I said, I really wanted them to start paying attention to each other's stuff here. Um, I said, I want you to find someone else's data visualization example, look at it, and see what questions that visualization causes you to think about, about that data. Then go to that person's bookmark and leave a comment where you list your questions. And so the one about alcoholic beverages was a very popular choice. And so a number of my students left the questions that came to mind upon looking at those bar charts. Um, and I asked them, just add this little any cues, any questions tag, so we know that you're doing it as part of this week's assignment. Um, and so we start to have this kind of thing. And this is, I mean, this is the kind of thing I want them to do in this class. One of the goals is to think about what stories can you see in a data visualization. So I want them to start practicing this, but to do it in a way where they kind of, you know, get to pick a lot what they want to, to focus on. Now, my other experiment this semester is Pinterest. So here's where things get a little bit weird. Um, so Pinterest is a social bookmarking site. Most of its users probably wouldn't use that term, but it's a social bookmarking site. Um, the difference between Pinterest and Digo is here you bookmark pictures and images. Right? So those of you who use Pinterest, what are some common things that you see on Pinterest? Craft projects? Okay, cool stuff. Like if you were in a dorm room, you might hang it over your bed, right? That, you know, those kind of things. Memes, yeah. Wedding dresses. Tons of wedding dresses. I actually posted on Facebook the other night. I was curious about this. So if, if a woman posts a lot of wedding dresses on Pinterest, what's the probability that she is engaged? Apparently, it's about 1%. Like, again, I'm trying to kind of understand the female mind here. 83% um, of Pinterest users in the US are female. I, I, I've seen good, pretty good data on that. But I like it because it's a visually based bookmarking service. So if we're going to share data visualization, it's a perfect kind of service for that. And it has this nice, pleasing interest. So this is one of my students, Sonia. And she had, you, within Pinterest, 
you have, instead of categories, you have boards. So it's like you're pinning pictures on a pin board. And so she has a board for lots of other stuff. I try not to pay attention to other boards. She has a board for Math 216, which is our course, and that's where she pins the stuff. So I gave my students a choice. So you can use Digo or Pinterest as your so social bookmarking platform. And about eight of my students chose Pinterest, and the other 68, 67 chose uh, Digo. Now I do teach engineers, and about two-thirds of them are men. So that may be something to do with it. But I think Sonia's done a good job here, right? She's finding these interesting things. We've had three assignments thus far, but she's just kind of got carried away and pinning interesting things, interesting data visualizations that she sees. And Pinterest gives you this nice kind of way to look at it. So again, I'm not hearing a lot of this kind of stuff, but I've had some success in having students, in that cartography course, we did the same kind of thing. And it was interesting to see what students picked up on. So I had a, I had a literature buff. She was a Sherlock Holmes fan, and that's why she was taking the cryptography course. And so she tended to bookmark things that had to do with cryptography and literature. I had some computer science geeks who were interested in information security, and so they would, they would bookmark kind of the latest news about information security and encryption and stuff. Back channels. One of my favorite, because I'm a big Twitter fan. And there's other ways to do back channel, but um, Twitter is one of my favorite. Let me just give you a couple of quick examples. And these are. There's, I could go on and on about using Twitter in class, but these are really about using Twitter outside of class. And this one is really cool. So this is bird, bird class. So um, Margaret Rubega teaches an ornithology course at the University of Connecticut. So she's a biologist. She teaches this course on birds. On Twitter, you can you post all these little messages all you want, but you can include a hashtag, so a pound sign and then a keyword. And it makes it easy to search. So you go to Twitter, you search for pound sign bird class, and you see all the tweets that include that hashtag. So it's, it's kind of an instant community on Twitter, just by people using the same hashtag. And so she set up this hashtag, and she asked her students, I forget the details, but it's like, you know, five times during the semester when you're out and about and you see a bird, tweet about it, <laughs> appropriately enough, and add the hashtag bird class so we can all see it and find it, right? And so you get these interesting things, like here Casey said back in April, saw a heron flying over Fenton River. Its large wings provide low wing loading for its body size, good for flight. I don't really know what that means, but clearly she's making a connection. It's a little forced here, but she's, you know, she's making a connection between something they talked about in class, the biomechanics of flight, and the bird that she just saw. Hillary says, morbid, but saw a dead bird in my barn today. Um, later, uh, Professor Rubega responded and said, this is bird class, it's not morbid, it's on topic. Um, I am guessing all the feather lice had left already, right? Again, you know, connecting it to something they talked about in class. And then this guy, good for him, he took a photo, OK? In East Longmeadow slash MA, saw an albino red tail hawk. Lack of melanin really screws up your camouflage. And he got a photo, right? Actually, on my computer, you can see there's a little red right there on the tail. The rest of it is all white. And he snagged that photo with his camera. And again, the idea here is that it's connecting the course material to where students are. It's another place where you see them. I see during springtime, they'll, they'll, they'll do their bird class tweets from spring break, where they're usually somewhere they're not usually. And so they'd see different birds. And so it's actually a little more interesting for them. Um, and they get to see each other's stuff. And you, know, you can tweet from a cell phone. You don't even need a smartphone. As long as you can do, send a text message, you can send a tweet. And so it's using technology that the students have on their, on, on, by their sides. Here's another Twitter use, and this one's a little more focused. Um, this one's by uh, Mark Sample, who teaches English at George Mason University. Um, and he had his students, he was teaching a, a sci-fi course, and he had his students watch Blade Runner outside of class. So it wasn't a shared experience, but they had you know, 72 hours to watch Blade Runner on Netflix or however else they could get it through the library. And he asked them to live tweet the experience. So as these students are on their own, asynchronously watching the same movie, they are tweeting about what they observe and what they see. Now, the thing that he did after, which is really cool, is he used this service called Storify, and he collected all these tweets. And he, the instructor, sorted them according to theme and subject matter. So he looked for the patterns in what they were talking about. And you can see a little bit. So these were all about variants. But here's a few tweets. You know, Forrest says, he's trying to prove that he's not a replicant by trying to fall in love, develop emotions, even though he knows he is. Brian says, I really love this detective private eye style narration, and it's interesting how the setting reminds me of the one in Neuromancer, which is something that they had read before. Um, and then Will says, 
Anytime somebody hunts you in their underwear, you know they mean business. So, you know, they say whatever they want to say. But he was able, Mark Sample was able to find some really interesting observations that students were making and collect them. And then he brought that collection of their tweets into class, and that's how they launched the class discussion that day. And again, they use a hashtag just to kind of create that community. Good old fashioned social network. A couple of other interesting examples that I think are kind of neat. Um, so there's the fictional personas idea, and I've seen this in a few different areas. Um, this is actually Patricia Armstrong, who teaches French at Vanderbilt. Um, I found about this. Our admissions department has students who blog and say great things about Vanderbilt. Um, and one of the students blogged about her experience in a French course. So I asked her, okay, who's teaching this course? This is kind of cool. It turns out it's Patricia Armstrong, who used to work with me in the Center for Teaching. So maybe not too surprising. But it's still a neat idea. And what she had the students do, this was an intermediate level French class, she had the students create fictional personas on Facebook. Um, and so they had to pick a name. They do everything in French. They kind of create this persona. And apparently there's something about like a mysterious cruise that they're all invited to. So there's a kind of a, a story or a game element to it as well. And so throughout the semester, they're going to have to interact with each other through their fake Facebook pers personas, which he says, being videotaped, um, is against Facebook terms of service. So they'll probably get kicked out at some point. <laughs> And at some point, I'll tell Patricia that this is not a long-term strategy here. Um, Facebook requires you to be yourself on Facebook. If they find out otherwise, you're out. So um, Twitter may be a better, better place to support this kind of stuff. Google Plus now has, has a policy that lets you be fake as well. So that might be a place to go. <laughs> and then David Silver, who I, I've never met. I, actually, I've never met many of these people. But um, he blogged about this for the Chronicle of Higher Education. He teaches a course on, um, he's kind of a food studies guy. And he had this course on kind of media and food. Um, the short version is it was a course about cooking shows. But I, I think there was more to it than that. Um, but he had his students use Flickr. So they had, to, they had to bake something. They had to document how they did it. And they had to share their recipe on the photo sharing site Flickr. And so you have this kind of step by step. You know, they're putting together a, something that you might find in, a, in a, a certain flavor, a certain kind of cookbook, right? Um, they also uh, brought their treats to class that day, and they tweeted about it too. So there's these interesting tweets about how everyone's like, can't wait for class today. My mouth is already watering. Um, but again, using this, uh, a public service like Flickr, where you can share photos and organize them and sort them and everything, and using that to tell a particular kind of story. 